Hello, everyone. Uh, good evening. Good afternoon for some. Uh, my name is Eric Story. I'm the outreach, outreach manager of the Laurier Centre for Military Strategic and Disarmament Studies in Waterloo, Ontario. Now, I and the rest of the folks at the Laurier Military Centre, as well as our partners, the Canadian Battlefields Foundation, the Juno Beach Centre Association, and the Gregg Centre for the Study of War and Society, would like to welcome you all to the third installment of the Maple Leaf Route webinar series. But before we begin, I would like to acknowledge the extensive history of the land in which the Laurier Military Center resides. Our office is located on the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee, Anishinaabe, and neutral peoples. In 1701, this land fell under the Dish with One Spoon Treaty between the Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe peoples, a treaty that was part of the Great Peace of Montreal in the same year that marked the end of the Beaver Wars of the 17th century. It represented and continues to represent today an eternal agreement to not only share and protect resources, but also solve conflicts peacefully. Eighty some years later, in 1784, the Haldeman Proclamation was signed between the Haudenosaunee and the British Crown following the American Revolution, and the Haudenosaunee were given a tract of land that extended six miles on either side of the Grand River from just north of Orangeville today to its source at Lake Erie. Today, this treaty territory remains the homeland of Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee communities, as well as the home of many Indigenous peoples across Turtle Island, and acknowledging their presence in the past and present reminds everyone of the responsibilities we all hold as treaty people. Now, I know I've, I've said this uh, in the last, the beginning of the last two webinars, but I'll say it again just for those who uh, maybe this is their first time tuning in. I'm going to tell you what, what exactly the Maple Leaf Route webinar series is, because some of you might be wondering. And I guess what this Maple Leaf Route webinar series is going to accomplish is every two weeks from May until September, we've had two already, this is our third, we will be following the Canadians through the battles of Normandy in 1944, from the D-Day beaches through the capture of Caen in July and the fighting towards Falaise in August. The cost of the Battles of Normandy for Canada was enormous. From the 6th of June to the 23rd of August, over 5,000 Canadian service people lost their lives at the battle. Any visitor to the war cemeteries in Normandy cannot help but be moved by such losses. Our, our nine part series, again, this is the third tonight, features a range of historians asking a range of historical questions. Some of these questions will be tactical, others will consider the little known role of Canadian women on the battlefield, such as tonight, and others yet will explore the importance of morale and the puzzle of psychological stress. All our speakers will reflect in some way on the ever-changing ways in which we remember the Canadians at the Battles of Normandy. Now, if after tonight's event and even throughout the series, you feel you have learned something of value, we hope that you will consider donating to the Canadian Battlefields Foundation and the Juno Beach Centre Association. During these difficult pandemic times, your donations will keep future tours alive and ensure that the Canadian contributions to the Second World War will not be forgotten. This month, the Juno Beach Centre Association is participating in the Great, Great Canadian Giving Challenge. And for every dollar you donate, you will be giving the Juno Beach Center a chance to win $20,000 to continue fulfilling its mandate of commemorating the legacy of our veterans. And if you donate $500, you will automatically receive a Canadian flag to be flown at the Juno Beach Center in Normandy, France to commemorate the sacrifices of Canadians during the Second World War. And you can donate to both of these organizations by going to our website, canadianmilitaryhistory.ca forward slash webinar and clicking donate at the top of the page. I'll say that just one more time for those who didn't hear. It's canadianmilitaryhistory.ca forward slash webinar. I'd now like to invite Dr. Jeffrey Hayes of the University of Waterloo, a director of the Canadian Battlefields Foundation, who has co-led with Brigadier General David Patterson many tours over the past 20 years to provide a brief history and overview of the mission of our partner for this Maple Leaf Route webinar series, the Canadian Battlefields Foundation. Jeff, take it away. Thanks, Eric. Welcome back and, and welcome to those that are meeting with us for the first time. Uh, 
the CBF, La Fondation Canadienne de Champ de Bataille, was created in the early 1990s by a group of determined veterans and academics who thought that the Canadian role in the Battle of Normandy could soon be forgotten. The CBF and the Juno Beach Center have worked, particularly in the last 20 years, 25, almost 30 in the case of the CBF, to ensure that the Canadian role in the campaign remains fresh in the minds of the citizens of France, of Europe, as well as Canada. Since the 6th of June, 2003, official ceremonies at the Juno Beach Center have brought together participants to reflect and remember. And the center is also an important place for citizens to learn about Canada, both past and present. On the next day, usually, but unfortunately not for the last two years, the foundation has organized three commemorative ceremonies at the Canadian Garden on the grounds of Le Memorial de Caen, at the Place de l'Ancien Boucherie in Caen, where the first Canadians uh, met with uh, French townspeople in the days of the liberation of Caen, and then finally in the Garden of the Abbey Ardennes, where Canadian soldiers were murdered in June of 1944. The 12 students chosen for the foundation's annual study tours actively participate in these ceremonies. And since the first tour in 1996, the foundation has brought together a remarkable array of people from all parts of the country, both men and women, some members of First Nations, some the grandchildren or perhaps even great-grandchildren of veterans, serving members of the armed forces, including veterans themselves, as well as future teachers, academics, and decision makers. And we'll hear from one of these alumni in a minute. This obviously is the second year that the CBF has been unable to organize a student tour. And as such, our foundation president, General Marc Lessard, agreed that a virtual tour, drawing as, uh, as Eric has suggested on a distinguished panel of academics, would offer a chance for a wider audience to see the foundation's mandate in practice. So if you will, imagine yourself again on the battlefields of Normandy with some of the best guides to inform, contextualize, and ultimately inspire. 16 June, 1944, 77 years ago, this day was D plus 10, according to the Allied timetable. The landings had taken place 10 days before and the bridgehead is slowly expanding including, of course, some of the events that have already been described by Professors Kopp and Milner. And it's on this day pretty clear 77 years ago that some of the women Dr. Glassford is going to speak about are preparing to land and to play this crucial role that uh, we're gonna hear about tonight. I should mention too, that for those of us familiar with the eminent French historian and member of the resistance, Marc Bloch was executed on this day by the Gestapo in Lyon. To introduce our next speaker, I want to bring in Brittany Dunn, a CBF alumnus from 2018. Brittany's currently a doctoral candidate in history at Wilfrid Laurier University, studying with Dr. Mark Humphreys. And Brittany's also the managing editor of Canadian Military History. Brittany, what impact has the CBF tour had on you? Thanks, Jeff. Um, so as um, Jeff mentioned, I participated in the 2018 tour um, and uh, I didn't realize how lucky I was, especially since, um, you know, unfortunately the past two years we haven't, uh, CBF hasn't been able to hold any tours because of the pandemic, so snuck in just in time. Um, the tour was a really incredible uh, experience um, for, for a lot of reasons, um, but I'll just highlight a couple. Uh, as, most military, as most military historians will tell you, uh, studying the ground is a really, really integral part of understanding um, conflicts. If you can see where battles were fought, you can have a better sense of studying them. So being able to walk the ground, examine those landscapes um, of both world wars was a really um, great experience and really improved my understanding of uh, the wars. And then alongside those battlefields themselves, uh, we also got to see the commemorative landscape of Europe. So that's the museums, the memorials, and all of the cemeteries. And uh, also not just viewing that kind of commemorative um, landscape, but also participating in it. 
And it, as Jeff mentioned, um, students are participating in a number of ceremonies over uh, the time of their tour. And it's really meaningful to um, be involved with those, those ceremonies in honoring uh, the lives of Canadians uh, during the wars. The tour also provided a really great chance to uh, connect with students across Canada that I probably wouldn't have met um, otherwise. I'm still in contact with uh, several of the people I met on the tour. Um, they've become very good friends. And not only is it a great way to make friends, but it's also a great way, um, especially if you kind of stick in academia as some of the students do, to really expand your scholarly uh, network. Uh, I now know uh, students at several universities um, versus maybe just my home university of Laurier. And that network gets even bigger when you consider um, all of the CBF uh, alum. Um, tours go back into the 90s. So there's a lot of CBF alum that uh, we're able to connect with and uh, it can be really interesting and nice connection to be, oh, I was on the tour in this year and, and meet people from different years. And not only was I able to kind of engage with scholars um, kind of closer to my age, but learning from our guides um, was incredible. Uh, the CBF is really amazing at choosing um, very, very knowledgeable guides. And I was really lucky on my tour to have a total of uh, four guides um, who each brought really uh, different perspectives and expertise to our tour. And well, being on, you know, kind of on the spot of battlefields can lend itself toward, you know, the tactical or operational histories. Um, the CBF guides are really amazing at making sure to include topics that may not be considered uh, maybe traditional military history, um, such as, you know, commemoration, or propaganda, or trauma. And tonight's talk, um, kind of continuing that tradition, um, is a really great example of um, these kind of other types of topics. And I'm really so excited to learn more um, from our speaker tonight, Dr. Sarah Glassford about the Canadian Red Cross and uh, its impact on the emotional and psycho psychological well-being of uh, Canadian servicemen. So Dr. Sarah Glassford is a social historian of Canada who researches the intertwined histories of women, children, wartime health, and humanitarian aid. She's the author of Mobilizing Mercy, A History of the Canadian Red Cross, uh, published by McGill Queens in 2017 and the co-editor uh, with Amy Shaw of Making the Best of It, Women and Girls of Canada and Newfoundland During the Second World War, um, which was published uh, just in 2020 by UBC. She works as the archivist at the University of Windsor's Letty Library. So welcome, Sarah. Hi, uh, good evening, everyone, or afternoon, wherever you are. And thank you for that introduction, Brittany. I'd like to start by thanking my colleagues at the Laurier Center, the Gregg Center, the Juno Beach Center, and the Canadian Battlefields Foundation for inviting me to be part of this series. And in the same vein, also to thank everyone in the audience, I can't see you, but I know you're there, I hope you're there, uh, for taking some time out of your day to join me here online. I hope you'll enjoy it, and I look forward to our question and answer time at the end. So I want to start by saying a few words about um, my relationship to this research topic. Uh, as the introduction suggested, I've spent many years researching and writing about various aspects of the history of the Canadian Red Cross, but none of that would have come to pass if um, it wasn't for this particular group of women that I'm going to talk about tonight. Um, I didn't give the history of the Red Cross much or any thought until I was working at my local branch as a summer student in 1998. And I came across a file on a slow July afternoon uh, of yellowed wartime news clippings, that terrible wartime newsprint that just falls apart uh, when it's this old. Uh, and it was clippings about local members of something called the Canadian Red Cross Corps that someone had brought in from the public. No one in the office had any idea what to do with it, but it looked old, so they didn't want to get rid of it. So I started reading through these clippings and an interesting story emerged that kind of piqued my interest and led to a whole career in research in some ways. I subsequently in later years came across some self-published memoirs by members of this same group. When I was doing research for my PhD, what became my book on the Red Cross, I kept coming across little references to these women during the Second World War, and then later still, when I was living in Ottawa for a number of years and volunteering in the Red Cross archives, uh, 
I discovered there was an entire cabinet full of photo albums and scrapbooks, nominal rules, training booklets, bits of uniform, all kinds of ephemera related to this group of women that I had not had access to or even known about when I was doing my earlier research. Essentially, this cabinet was an entire archive collected and curated by the members of this group uh, in the 60 years following their wartime service. They were their own memory keepers, and as they reached the ends of their lives, they donated this trove of material to the Red Cross, and then in 2018, I was able to help facilitate the donation of that cabinet worth of material to the Canadian War Museum, which is where it now resides, and I hope other researchers will be able to use it in future. So basically, this small group of women and their wartime work have been one of those topics that have stayed with me for a long time. And a few years ago, when I started putting together this collection of essays that became the book Making the Best of It, I decided it was time to really dig in and, and see what I could say about this story. So that's where this talk comes from tonight. When I started sifting through all of this research material that I had gathered over the years, one thing really stood out, and it was directly tied to the fact that a lot of the sources were ones that the core members themselves had created, saved, and gathered. They were not official records, they were very personal records. And what stood out to me was how much this experience meant to these women, both at the time and how much it continued to mean for many of them for the rest of their lives. So if you could see my slideshow, uh, I have a quotation there. Uh, so it's a woman named Nancy Lang who said, Excitement, fear, joy, sorrow, good times, bad times, companionship and laughter touched us all. And Nancy was one of four women who founded something called the Overseas Club, which was essentially a kind of veterans or alumna association for women who had participated overseas in this Canadian Red Cross Corps. And she became its official archivist. So a lot of those materials I eventually came across in the mystical cabinet uh, had lived in her apartment for several decades. And her quotation sums up quite nicely, I think, the crux of what we're gonna look at tonight, which is the fact that whatever else these women's overseas work and its impact on servicemen might have been, it was also deeply and profoundly colored by a wide range of powerful emotions. And we can see this at work in a cassette tape interview between Nancy Lang, one of her core colleagues, Jane McGilvery, and the then librarian of the Canadian Red Cross, Anne Buttron, which Anne recorded in 1993. She went over to Nancy's apartment, Jane was there. They went through some of these, these artifacts and documents that Nancy had collected. And Anne was asking questions about, well, basically things tr that would help her understand what the core was, what it did, what kind of uniforms they wore, the sort of factual, um, questions that any historian would be interested in. But again and again, as you listen to this cassette, you hear Nancy and Jane, the women who had actually participated in it, veering away from the facts and circling back again and again to the people in the photos and how they felt about the events and the work that they describe. So as I listened to that interplay between historical evidence on the one hand and memory on the other, it really brought home how powerful the emotional dimensions of this experience were uh, and the importance of networks of blood, friendship, and nationality for those both male and female who served overseas in the Second World War. It also led me to, in my research, to sort of set aside some of the usual questions about how the Second World War might have been good for women opening up new opportunities, um, and to instead think about how these women of the Red Cross Corps coped and helped servicemen cope with what was bad about the war. So in case you're thinking, why bother thinking about emotions in wartime? Aren't there more interesting things to think about? I just wanna say a few words about that. Historians of emotions emphasize that the nuances of wartime societies can't be truly understood without paying attention to the emotional lives of the people who inhabited them. Um, one great quote that kind of sums this up is, adding emotions is like adding color to a black and white image. And there's also a special value, I think, in studying women's emotions in wartime, because too often they get reduced to stereotypes. And you've probably seen this in movies and, and books and things. They're either the grieving wife and mother, or they're left out entirely. So we happen to have this wealth of letters and memoirs and oral histories by Red Cross Corps members to help us examine the emotional dimensions of wartime life 
but most of them were produced long after the war and could be colored by nostalgia or forgetfulness. So I wanna take a moment to introduce you to three core members whose writings help us avoid the nostalgia trap. So our first of three kind of key sources is a woman named Jean Ellis from Victoria, BC. And in 1947, she published a very lively memoir of her service called Face Powder and Gunpowder, which is a great title. Second key source is a woman named Lois McDonald of Ottawa, who collected and self-published her wartime letters to her parents in 2005 under the title Wartime Letters Home. And third key informant is Mary McDonald, no relation, also of Ottawa, who went on to a post-war career as executive secretary to Prime Ministers Trudeau and Pearson, and whose wartime letters to her mother and sister are now held at Library and Archives Canada. And these three are, are useful for a variety of reasons. They're also really fitting to focus on for this series, because from 1943 until shortly after the end of the war, all three of these women served first in England and later in Northwestern Europe, following the Canadian advance up the Maple Leaf route as part of Canadian hospital units. So we'll be talking more broadly about these women in Britain as well, but there are our, our three key informants who were following the Maple Leaf route not far behind the advance. So these three women's writings serve as longitudinal case studies across several years of overseas work, and they give us a depth and an intimacy that are missing from some of their peers' later recollections. So you'll hear me refer frequently to Jean, Lois, and Mary, and when we combine their insights with a wider array of core members' recollections, we come away with a really vibrant portrait of young women's voluntary service overseas for the Canadian Red Cross. So I'm going to give you the nutshell version of what we're going to spend the rest of our time talking about. So I guess if you want to go get a snack, you could do that. Um, but here's, here's the key takeaways. What we find and what we'll explore is that after leaving Canada, the women of the Corps quickly created and recreated extensive networks of friendship, kinship, and romance. And those emotional bonds became highly meaningful elements central to their wartime experiences that both helped to sustain them and also to sustain the servicemen whom they encountered through the most difficult elements of their time in Europe. In the face of really stressful or traumatic experiences and the draining forms of emotional labor that they provided to enlisted men, these core members shored up their own resilience through very deliberate strategies tied to their personal relationships and how they spent their leisure hours. So that's, that's the short version. Now we're going to pull that apart and see what it actually looks like uh, in terms of real women and, and their experiences. So let's step back for a minute and just talk about why the Red Cross sent any women at all overseas during the Second World War. The Canadian Red Cross as an organization is steeped in some pretty potent ideals of compassion and caring and service to suffering humanity. It was formed in 1896 and has a mandate to aid the sick and wounded in war. So there's the obvious connection. During the First World War, it established a powerful relationship with Canadians through its relief effort for sick, wounded, and captured Canadian servicemen. And because of this First World War precedent, during the Second World War, the Canadian Red Cross was Canada's preeminent war charity. It had 2.1 million adult members, 900,000 youth members, millions more casual donors, and scores of volunteers from coast to coast. Its humanitarian appeal crossed linguistic and religious lines, which thought was important in this country, and it even drew support from pacifist and non-resistant groups, such as the Mennonite community. So what was it doing with all of these volunteers and all of this money? Well, it was doing a lot of things. It was sending POW food parcels to Canadian and other allied prisoners of war. It was sending supplementary medical and surgical items for military hospitals. It was providing visits and comfort items for Canadian servicemen in hospital. It was producing uh, maple leaf clubs uh, in London that offered food, lodging, and recreation for troops on leave. It was pioneering occupational therapy programs in military hospitals. And that's really just the tip of the iceberg. By late 1942, because of all these activities overseas, the Red Cross was facing a shortage of voluntary labor in Britain. There's a lot of war charity work going on over there and not enough people to help keep it going. The Red Cross was also starting to feel a need for certain specialist skills. So they began importing members of the Canadian Red Cross Corps to help the overseas headquarters accomplish this work. 
So you're probably thinking, okay, great, but what was the Canadian Red Cross Corps? How were its members any different from ordinary Red Cross volunteers? Well, the Canadian Red Cross Corps was a wartime creation, first piloted in 1940, when Canada feared an attack on its own shores. The Corps was designed to harness the enthusiasm and energy of young women who sought more active roles than the knitting and fundraising that had, had to satisfy many of their mothers and grandmothers. So keep in mind, this is the same time period that sees a surge of women's paramilitary activity and the creation of women's armed forces in Canada. So there's definite interest among the younger female population in taking a more active role in wartime. The Red Cross Corps eventually consisted of four sections, transport, so they were driving heavy vehicles like trucks and ambulances, a nursing auxiliary that consisted of semi-trained helpers in hospitals, better known as VADs, an office administration section that had clerical and bookkeeping skills, and a food administration that was trained in mass quantity cooking and nutrition. So you can see how these are areas that could be really useful if Toronto was bombed or something like that. Each section undertook relevant specialist training to provide emergency service in case of disaster or enemy attack, and all members learned miscellaneous skills, including map reading, first aid, and so on, just to be prepared. Aside from their specialized training, several elements distinguished Corps members from ordinary Red Cross volunteers in Canada. They wore military-style uniforms, which is why I really wanted you to be able to see some of these photos. They were subject to a hier hierarchical chain of command, they practiced military drill, and those first three items were in, intended to instill a sense of discipline in this group, which is not often something you have with volunteers who tend to be a bit rainy. Uh, they had to pass mandated training courses, they had to fulfill a high number of volunteer hours, and the result of all of this together, these things that set them apart, was a disciplined, highly efficient volunteer organization with a strong esprit de corps. So it's not military, but it has elements of, of military life in it. As of 1942, there were 45 detachments of the Canadian Red Cross Corps active across Canada from Victoria to Charlottetown, and some 15,000 women enrolled in the Corps at some point during the war. People kind of came and went and some stayed. Some transferred into or out of the armed forces, depending if they thought they could get overseas more quickly in one or the other. And membership peaked in 1944 when 6,000 women sported the Corps uniform. Their efficiency, dedication, and versatility made them essential to home front work for the Red Cross. And those same attributes of discipline, training, and efficiency made Corps members an ideal labor source for overseas Red Cross work. So between December 1942 and December 1947, a total of 641 Corps members were sent to Britain, Italy, and Northwestern Europe as part of a new overseas detachment which earned them the nickname of ODs. And I will often refer to them as ODs because it's a little less of a mouthful. So the ODs were civilian volunteers. They received about $5 a week from the Red Cross for basic necessities, but were otherwise unpaid and self-supporting throughout their service. They were universally white, largely Anglo-Saxon, although there were a few Francophones. And they included young women of modest means. Many of them had clerical jobs before going overseas, but a few came from privileged backgrounds and the most notable was Margaret Eaton of the Eaton's department store family. Overseas, they worked very closely with members of the military, so they were granted the courtesy of officer rank. All right, so first major section that I wanna talk about of their time overseas is to think about what they were doing while they were on duty and specifically to talk about emotional labor and resilience. So we've got our core women in the overseas detachment. We've got some of them overseas as of 1943. Next question, what are they doing there? And how does that relate to the emotional lives of servicemen, which was of course my big title for this presentation. So we can turn to one of our three friends, Mary McDonald, to give us an answer to both questions. In August, 1943, just before she left for overseas, Mary's core detachment in Ottawa organized a little going away celebration and presented her with a poem that praised her boundless energy, her organizational skill and her creative ideas. So these were obviously the attributes that her friends at home expected Mary would be called upon to use in her work with servicemen in Europe. And she did put those skills to use. However, once she got overseas, Mary and every other OD found that more was required of her 
than just her practical tasks for the Red Cross. As Red Cross representatives, and as women specifically, the ODs were also expected to perform emotional labor, which means we better pause for a moment and talk about what emotional labor is. So emotional labor is a term coined by scholar Arlie Hochschild in 1983. She was studying people like um, airline stewardesses. So you can imagine where this is coming from. So Hochschild explains emotional labor by writing that, quote, the world turns to women for mothering and this fact silently attaches itself to many a job description. So it's a kind of hidden element of work that many women end up doing. The work of the Red Cross Corps overseas is a great example of emotional labor. So the ODs in practical terms, once they got overseas, they staffed hospitals, they staffed canteens, they staffed servicemen's clubs, they drove ambulances, they filled a variety of administrative jobs that brought them into contact with servicemen. And in every single one of these instances, on top of their assigned tasks, the ODs performed emotional labor. And by that, I mean they deliberately behaved in certain ways so as to increase, decrease, or otherwise manage emotions in the servicemen with whom they interacted. So again, if you think about an airline stewardess, they're always cheerful, no matter how upset the patron gets, they're going to do their best to help that patron stay calm and have a good experience. And so that's a great example of emotional labor. So that's what our core women are doing on top of their actual tasks, is they're trying to inculcate certain emotions, a certain level of morale in servicemen. So why is this the case? Why are they doing this emotional labor? Well, we can go back to the mandate of the Red Cross in wartime for an explanation. During the Second World War, the Canadian Red Cross directed its humanitarian aid toward two complementary sets of needs. And they didn't talk about it this way at the time, but if you look at it, it very much falls into this dichotomy. So on the one hand, they're focused on physical survival, and they're addressing that set of needs through prisoner of war food parcels, hospitals, ambulances, medical supplies, obvious connection, excuse me. Second set of needs they're addressing have to do with psychological resilience. So they're addressing that in servicemen through hospital visits, providing hometown newspapers, providing canteens that serve home style meals. Uh, they're providing a diverse array of items that were known as comforts, which ranged from cigarettes to Christmas stockings to small bags of personal hygiene items. Both of those elements, physical survival and psychological resilience, are important, obviously. Second, the psychological resilience side. So 21st century psychologists define resilience as the process of adapting well in the face of adversity, trauma, threats, or significant sources of stress. And we've all heard quite a lot about resilience during the COVID-19 pandemic, I'm sure. So people's resilience is directly related to their behaviors, thoughts, and actions. And culture and personality can influence what sorts of strategies work best for each person. But there are two almost universally most effective resilience builders. And those two are first, personal connections with caring people, and second, small acts of self-care. And if you think about some of those things I listed a minute ago, both of those resilience builders are addressed in Red Cross efforts. So in their own ways, a warm sweater after being torpedoed and rescued at sea, or a sympathetic chat with a hospital visitor would each help reinforce a serviceman's ability to bounce back in the face of adversity. Now, the Canadian Red Cross specifically recruited women to provide these types of service because of its history. World War I had established the Red Cross as a special channel for women's work in wartime and framed it as a form of mothering, which, which comes from 19th and early 20th century ideas about women's quote, natural skills as, as mothers and in the domestic realm. But at the same time, compassion in this era was also seen as a distinctly feminine emotion because early 20th century Canadians associated compassion with nurturing and caregiving as we see mothers often doing. During both world wars at the same time, the Canadian government and military relied on voluntary organizations like the Red Cross or the YMCA to connect servicemen to their humanity and to the family and community life that they were fighting for 
And both government and military believed very strongly that maintaining links between the home front and the battlefront would boost morale on both sides. When Jean Ellis, one of our three friends uh, of Victoria, landed in Normandy with the first group of ODs and Canadian nursing sisters, she recognized her role as a link between soldiers and civilians. The men that they passed along the Maple Leaf Route barraged them with questions and wolf whistles, but she noticed at the same time that some of those men had tears in their eyes, and she herself became misty-eyed in response. And she explained this in her memoir by saying, quote, we knew that we reminded the boys of their women folk at home who they missed so much, and they reminded us of the boys we would never see again. Supporting Jean's interpretation, her sort of off-the-cuff uh, interpretation, scholar Joshua Goldstein argues that when women play traditionally feminine roles in war zones, servicemen are powerfully reminded that the battlefield is finite and the other wor world still exists. We get a rare glimpse of what it meant to servicemen to encounter women in the war zone, and specifically of the kinds of emotional labor that they were performing, through two poems written by a serviceman named Frankie Hamilton in December 1944 at number 12 Canadian General Hospital in Belgium. In the first poem called To a Red Cross Sister, so one of our core women, he praises a core member as steadfast, friendly, beautiful, and wondrous kind. Her regular visits to the men in the wards, quote, brighten up their day and faces once so racked with pain light up when she appears to help them on their way. In his second poem called Our Sunshine Ray, Hamilton describes the quote, cheery words and lovely smile of another core member who, as he wrote, makes us think of home, of sweetheart, wife, or mother while we are so alone. So it's not great poetry, but it packs a lot of, of information in terms of how servicemen were viewing these women in the war zone. Both poems suggest that core women's work in military hospitals and convalescent homes and perhaps in other settings as well, was read by servicemen as a form of compassion. And again, compassion, uh, if we think about that, was defined as individual feelings of empathy expressed through action. And compassion is notable for facilitating a feeling of being cared for, of being seen, felt, known, of not being alone. And there's a, a nice connection with the last line of, of Hamilton's poem of making us think of home, sweetheart, white, wife, and mother while we are so alone. So you can see that connection there. So this kind of compassion that Hamilton identifies can expedite mental and emotional healing, or at least temporarily staunch someone's suffering. Ottawa native Lois McDonald told her parents that making her daily rounds on the hospital wards took hours because of all the conversations she had all the photos from home she looked at, and all the stories she listened to along the way. Even today, studies of male friendship suggest that men often find it easier to share their emotions with women than with other men. This may be particularly true in military contexts, where scholars tell us that soldiers quickly learn the value of controlling and displaying their emotions, of when it is and is not appropriate to express emotions of one kind or another. Until the 1990s and early 2000s, we know that the Canadian military cultivated a stoic masculinity within its ranks. Troops were expected to repress emotions such as fear, pain, and guilt. So if emotional support was required under that system, it had to come from chaplains, nurses, voluntary agencies, or a soldier's family and friends. So what that means overall is that when a Second World War serviceman could share his feelings, or be emotionally vulnerable with a woman, it played an important part in helping him process and cope with psychological or physical trauma. So emotional labor infused the work that core members engaged in. It also shaped their larger place in the landscape of wartime society. We might uh, explain it by saying that men were the actors of war, but women gave meaning to it. It was women's role to encourage and to support to be admiring spectators, and to essentially build up the scenery for heroism and sacrifice. So when core women like Lois went through the wards, listened to stories, talked about photos from home and what was going on, they're, they're engaging in this sort of encouraging, admiring behavior. They're putting out an unseen effort, sort of like housework. It doesn't quite count as labor, 
but it's nevertheless crucial to getting other things done. So again, back to the idea of emotional labor. More broadly, women mattered enormously to enlisted men. And there's, again, a kind of dichotomy here in that on the one hand, women matter as these highly sexualized creatures of fantasy uh, in the form of pinups and of conquests, whether real or imaginary. And on the other hand, they're these pure idealized symbols of the best in life, the loving mothers and faithful wives and sympathetic sisters waiting at home. And those contrasting roles of women in wartime uh, figured largely in Lois McDonald's assessment of the qualities that were needed for an OD to be a Red Cross welfare officer overseas in Northwestern Europe. She wrote, one would need to be a master of psychology, a glamor girl, a comedian, Dorothy Dix, who was an advice columnist, a Florence Nightingale, a Santa Claus, a fount of wisdom and information, and have the patience of Job all rolled into one. So there's some contradictions in that description, aren't there? And those could be problematic. Lois added that it was important to let the patients treat you as a sister or girlfriend and be gay and friendly, but not to the extent of letting them get fresh. <laughs> ODs were like nursing sisters in that they tried to promote a sisterly rapport by referring to servicemen, especially in hospital, as son or our boys or the lads. But notably, Lois included being gay and glamorous in her imaginary job description for the ODs. And as Sir Archibald McIndoe's wartime work with facially disfigured airmen repeatedly demonstrated, interest or flirtation between attractive young women and recovering patients often provided a psychological turning point in a serviceman's overall recovery. So it's interesting that this was going on in a sort of scientific study context within um, airmen and plastic surgery. But even Lois, just doing her job on the wards as an OD, could tell that there was a real morale boosting impact from a little attention from a pretty girl. Emotional labor also has an important role in shaping the experience of those who perform it. So when we read back into the past, it's significant to note that most ODs felt that their professional relationship with servicemen involved a supportive give and take on both sides. So Lois acknowledged that, quote, one might get the impression that we're here giving a lot and getting little in return. But she actually felt that the men were more than deserving of the effort because they were sacrificing their youth and health for the wartime cause. She also wrote to her parents that she felt very inspired by the men's kindness and courage. Of course, they try our patience to the utmost, she added, but in the end, she was convinced, quote, we really do little for them in return for what they have given us. So we see in Lois McDonald's letters home and in Frankie Hamilton's poems praising the work of the core women, that the emotional labor performed by ODs was meaningful both to the women who performed it and to the servicemen who were on the receiving end. But we have to acknowledge that emotionally meaningful work still takes a toll on those who perform it. In an article about her work in a Canadian hospital overseas, one anonymous core member wrote, quote, I think I have aged 10 years in the last two days. So why, why is that and why does it matter? Well, if we go back to Arlie Hochschild's concept of emotional labor, we find that a key element of emotional labor is that managing other people's emotions is very hard work. <laughs> and maybe some of you who've been at home for too long with family members may, may recognize a little bit of this. It can demand enormous effort and self-control because you're essentially subduing or managing your own emotions in order to achieve the desired effect in others while trying to make it look effortless. So for example, projecting cheerfulness and high spirits required a woman to sublimate her own fatigue or anxiety or sadness or frustration. On the other hand, displaying compassion obliged a woman to surrender to the pain of another person and then convey empathy in that moment. 21st century studies show that over the long term, emotional labor, especially when it involves suppressing your own emotions, can actually harm your physical and mental health and lead to burnout. So that was a real threat for these women, whether they knew it or not. And we see this tension between performing one emotion and feeling another emotion in many ODs wartime writings. 
but the most harrowing experiences were reserved for those who drove ambulances or worked as welfare officers in military hospitals. So one OD named Francis Martin Day recalled, we went in with a ditty bag, which was like a bag of personal care items. We went in with a ditty bag and had to be ho, ho, ho to keep their spirits up, but it was awful, horrible. While handing out cigarettes to newly admitted stretcher cases in her hospital in Normandy, Jean Ellis similarly remembered trying to be cheerful, although it was a struggle not to burst into tears. And she writes, saying things like, hi, chum, anything we can do for you? Sounded slightly silly and very inadequate, but the boys appeared to like it. Although ODs became accustomed to seeing men in pain, the scale and variety of the carnage must have remained shocking. So Mary MacDonald, who worked as a welfare officer at number 12 Canadian General Hospital in Belgium from July 1944 to November 1945, saw more than 17,500 patients admitted over an 11 month period. Some 12,000 of them were serious surgical cases. Now, because of medical advances at the time, only 58 of those surgical patients died but the steady stream of very badly wounded, emotionally vulnerable men would have drained even the most bubbly young woman's reserve of cheerfulness. It was the OD's job to show that they cared, to pass out cigarettes and tea, to write letters, to stroke heads, to adjust pillows, to talk or just to listen. But cumulatively, even such small acts of caring were physically and emotionally exhausting and sometimes traumatizing. Like many veterans, OD Dorothy Burgoyne Doolittle never spoke of her feelings about what she had seen and done during the war. Instead, she chose to share amusing anecdotes with her children. However, her daughters discerned the lasting emotional impact of her service in the fact that she could not bear to watch scenes of air raids or bombings in movies or TV shows set in wartime. And it's not difficult to connect this lifelong aversion with her experiences of nighttime air raids in London, and later with the devastation she witnessed behind the Allied advance in Italy. Being strafed by German planes and seeing burned out shells of military vehicles or bloated bodies of livestock made a similarly strong impression on the first ODs to land in Normandy. Among them, of course, were Jean Ellis and her two fellow Corps members with number seven Canadian General Hospital. They were among the first women to follow the Canadian advance into Normandy after D-Day. And once their unit was established in France, the overwhelming volume of casualties, which was alluded to earlier tonight, meant that the three ODs who were not supposed to play any medical role, purely a caring one, the three ODs were temporarily seconded to assist the nursing sisters with medical duties. There's just so many casualties, they need all hands on deck. So Jean was assigned to a ward for patients with severe head wounds, and you can just imagine, right? She was deeply shaken by what she saw. On the first day, she left the tent several times to be violently ill, had no appetite by evening, and when utter exhaustion produced sleep, she wrote, utter awful dreams went with it. Work-related fatigue and emotional strain were not the only burdens borne by core women overseas, like all other Canadians, Many of them carried a heavy weight of anxiety for loved ones and friends who were involved in the fighting. In her 1947 memoir, Jean Ellis described listening to a BBC radio report of the D-Day assault in the mid-morning of June 6, 1944, alongside the women and men of Number 7 Canadian General Hospital. Some of the listeners were visibly excited, but Ellis also remembered several girls standing as if stunned, with tears running down their faces or lips moving in prayer and she assumed that someone very close to their hearts must be in danger. Similarly, when Lois MacDonald learned that her good friend from teenage years, Robert Spike Rochon, had been killed, it was the straw that broke the camel's back for her grief. She wrote to her parents, that seemed to be the last straw for all the tears I had stored up. Went back to our hotel, up to my room, threw myself down and sobbed. It was not just for Robert, but for the many friends, all the fine young men that had been lost. A little over a week later, on the night before the official VE Day celebrations, Lois and many of her female hospital colleagues were subdued and restless. The last years have been too tense, she mused. We have seen too much and lost too many friends to forget it all so soon. <laughs> 
The ODs themselves were often in danger as well, and this too drained their reserves of resilience. The Atlantic crossing was tense and perilous. While they were stationed in Britain, they were subject to air raids and buzz bombs. One group was torpedoed en route to Italy and lost all their kit, although they did luckily escape with their lives. And those who were posted to Italy or Normandy with hospital units were at risk from bombings, landmines, and potentially a sudden pushback by enemy forces. Reflecting on the entire experience decades later, O.D. Phyllis Elder Matheson concluded, if we knew what we were getting into, we probably would not have gone. So what can we take from all of that? Well, I think core members' letters and memoirs suggest that, as for frontline soldiers, the ability to endure, to take what the enemy dished out and stick it for the duration, became a kind of currency of courage for these women. But sticking it required resilience. And as we've seen, these women's personal resilience was constantly drained by the work that they did to support servicemen's resilience. So they therefore needed to constantly replenish their own reserves through specific actions, behaviors, and thought processes. And that's what we're gonna talk about in the last section here. So we've been focusing on the on-duty work that women did to provide emotional support to servicemen. And I now want to explore the, way that core, or the ways that core women's off-duty activities influence their ability to do that work. And as part of that, how their interactions with servicemen off-duty could be both a source of women's resilience and also another drain upon it. It kind of works both ways. So in a nutshell, a core members' ability to perform emotional labor for the benefit of servicemen, both on and off duty, was critically supported by two things. First, their personal networks of support, and second, self-care through leisure activities. This began right from the moment a core member learned she had been posted overseas. It was exciting to have this opportunity to go over, but it also meant that you were going to face a lot of new challenges far from your established support networks. And the strain of that separation could strike at any time. Jean Ellis had a memorable experience while she was watching a movie with a Canadian soldier friend of hers just before Christmas. She writes that when the actors on screen sang Oh Holy Night, both Jean and her companion suddenly felt the aching pangs of homesickness. He just grabbed my hand and hung on tightly, she wrote. We didn't dare look at each other. And I think it's nice that we see in this instance Canadian men and women kind of offering reciprocal emotional support in that moment. Like servicemen, ODs relied heavily on contact with people from home to provide them with that moral support. Long distance phone calls were prohibitively expensive, so correspondence was really the vital link. Just two examples give us a taste of what this meant. Lois McDonald, in her two years abroad, received about 90 individual parcels from parents, friends, relatives, and coworkers, and she wrote 300 letters to her parents alone. So you figure over two years, that's one every two or three days. Mary McDonald's fall at Library and Archives Canada includes 126 letters to her relatives, but doesn't include her weekly letters to her brother Neil in the RCIF or all the letters and postcards she sent to her friends. So there's a lot of mail going into supporting these women's networks. Sharing details of daily life in both directions helped to foster a sense of security and stability and allowed ODs to maintain their traditional networks of emotional support. Some of them were lucky enough to recreate familiar social networks in person. For instance, in Halifax, while awaiting transport to Britain, several ODs briefly reunited with enlisted male relatives or friends who happened to be in port at the same time, and one almost too wild to be true story has it that one OD recognized her brother's Corvette or you know his ship the Corvette as their convoy crossed the ocean and they managed to have an animated conversation with the help of megaphones mid-Atlantic much to everyone's delight including their own. The urge to reconnect merely increased once they reached Britain. One OD squeezed in a visit to a friend between docking at Southampton and reporting to core headquarters in London and on her first night in London, Mary McDonald was telephoned by two Ottawa friends who were already there, convinced a third friend to go out with her so she could experience the London blackout. And early the next morning, bright and early, she was at RCAF headquarters trying to track down her brother, Neil, who was posted somewhere in England. For some core women, loved ones were integral to their decision to go overseas in the first place. Either they volunteered to be near a husband or they sought a distraction from the grief of his death. 
Frances Martin did both. She joined the Corps in 1943 when her husband, RCAF Wing Commander Norman Martin, was posted to England. Norman urged Frances to move heaven and earth to join him, leaving their three-year-old son Grant in the care of relatives. We were very young and very much in love, she recalled, adding that she would no longer make the same decision to leave their son. It requires understanding how it was in wartime, she wrote, living from day to day and grasping at straws of happiness when you could. Norman was killed before Frances left for Britain, but she decided to accept her overseas posting anyway, seeing it as a useful way to bridge a difficult time. O.D. Phyllis Elder Matheson recalled that some war widows accepted overseas postings to get an atmosphere of the life they had not shared. But this kind of proximity to the war zone could be a double-edged sword. For Jean Ellis, landing in Normandy was a painful experience. The carnage she saw there brought to mind her own husband's death early in the war. So she drew on her desire to do what she called as good a job as the invading allies to keep herself going. Lois McDonald's friend Eileen Corkett benefited from an overseas core policy that gave first choice of hospital postings to married women so that they could be close to their husbands. Eileen was assigned to number one Canadian neurological and plastic surgery unit in Hampshire, where her husband George was a patient. When his health permitted it, they found nearby lodgings to share and celebrated their fourth wedding anniversary in England, the first wedding anniversary they had ever spent together. However, an overseas posting did not guarantee a happy reunion. Poor Biddy Wilkins left Canada with the Corps in July 1944, but arrived in Liverpool only to discover that her husband Ron had departed the very same day for Algiers. They were reunited in March 1946, just in time to travel back to Canada together. Lois's friend Eileen faced a crueler outcome. A few weeks after her husband George rejoined his regiment in Italy, he was killed in action. This left Eileen pregnant and far from home. But fortunately, the support network that she had created in England came to her aid. Friends from her core work in Basingstoke visited her repeatedly. Lois MacDonald sent a letter of condolence from Belgium and the Red Cross arranged for Eileen to return home to Canada. Lois described the stoic Eileen as a brick, saying she certainly has what it takes. And this is a nice little moment of reminding us that 1940s Canadians admired this kind of stiff upper lip response to adversity, which is a resilient strategy in its own right. And the people in their lives helped them to achieve it. Canadian Red Cross Corps members left Canada with a strong sense of core identity, as we talked about earlier. And they bonded as members of this new overseas detachment as they were traveling to the war zones by train and ship with others of their cohort. When they reached Britain, they then joined in overcrowded accommodations in Core House, which was three interconnected townhouses in London. It housed up to 100 women at a time, providing a home for core members working in London and others who were on leave or in transit. And this communal living in, in overcrowded wartime conditions, of course, provoked outbursts of temper, but also fostered bonds of friendship. And we find that core women provided each other with emotional support through these friendships sharing confidences, talking over problems. In particular, they often engaged in supportive talk about their brothers, boyfriends, husbands, friends, who was serving where, what they were doing, what letters had been received. As Jean Ellis wrote in her memoir, fear is a terrible thing when one is alone, but it fades to some extent with company. The sheer number of Canadian servicemen in Britain and then in Western Europe meant that core women encountered brothers, cousins, neighbors, schoolmates, family friends, and friends of friends with surprising frequency. For instance, Lois MacDonald reconnected with her friend flying officer Harvey Fenton during a mutual weekend leave in London and went with him to Buckingham Palace to see him receive the Distinguished Flying Cross from George VI. It sounds like a lovely little weekend jaunt to me. Brand new mixed gender friendships also sprang up overseas, including Lois, who as an only child, really came to cherish her friendship with Ad, a pharmacist at her hospital in Belgium, whom she came to regard as a brother. Now these male friends and social companions might be single, but they were equally likely to be married or otherwise spoken for. And Jean Ellis explained to her late 1940s readers that no eyebrows were lifted when the women went on dates with their married male friends because the wives were so far away and many had asked their husbands to look up core girls they knew overseas. 
She also added reassuringly, it wasn't all fun and frolic going out with homesick men who spent hours telling us how wonderful their wives and children were, but we felt it was part of our job to act as wailing walls once in a while, which is a clear reference to emotional labor. Some married men were glad to be away from their wives, Jean admitted, but the best of them, as she put it, soft peddled their married status and treated us as charming companions. So again, we see servicemen providing a welcome morale boost to core women, even as core women are supporting them in turn. These mixed gender friendships seem to have been especially important to servicemen as tensions built in the lead up to D-Day. Jean noticed that men put on a brave front in their letters home but more freely admitted their fears to the ODs, in her opinion, because the men knew the ODs wouldn't think less of them since they were sharing in that wartime context. Core women overseas met and formed connections with people from many allied nations and liberated countries, but fellow Canadians often earned special notice simply because of their nationality. In November 1943, Mary MacDonald described the happy exclamation, hello Canada, as a familiar greeting by then. ODs and their servicemen friends made extensive use of the British Rail Network, London's multitude of attractions, and a Canadian Red Cross hospitality arrangement scheme by visiting one another and traveling around Britain and later liberated Europe when they were off duty. And these young Canadians abroad sometimes went to extraordinary lengths to spend time together. Lois MacDonald and her core colleagues at Number 12 Canadian General Hospital in Belgium became very good friends with the officers of a regiment of Manitoba dragoons that was stationed nearby. When the Manitobans moved on, both groups traveled long distances to continue socializing and sightseeing together. Two examples will suffice. One weekend, Lois and her friend Sheila Burks hitchhiked to Holland to attend a dance with the dragoons. And another time, the dragoons drove 500 miles from Germany in a captured car to spend their leave time with Lois and Sheila. And these efforts were not for nothing. They contrib contributed significantly to the resilience of the people involved. After spending one 48 hour leave with Sheila and the Manitobans in Holland, Lois wrote that it left her quote, ready to start again tomorrow with renewed vim and vigor. Jean Ellis had clear memories of the scene that met her, her fellow ODs, Connie and Marge, and the approximately 57 Canadian nursing sisters when they landed in Normandy not long after D-Day. As they made their way along the Maple Leaf route, they received a riotous greeting from the Army and Air Force units that were camped in fields and orchards along the road. Upon their initial landing at the beachhead, quote, everyone cheered, everyone tried to shake our hands, and the Canadians pushed through to make sure they got a word in. Right up until their arrival at their hospital, they were barraged with questions from Canadian servicemen who, quote, asked any old thing just to get an answer in their own language. And of course, there were the usual wolf calls. For their part, the women immediately tried to reestablish connections, asking after the whereabouts and welfare of people whom they knew and units from their hometowns. And I think we see in these examples, Canadians representing home to each other, which is a very potent and nostalgia cloaked ideal in wartime. So clearly the women of the Corps valued their friendships with servicemen overseas, but they, in some cases, I think the friendships they developed with one another were among the strongest. And this was apparent when some of the ODs joined as passengers, the tens of thousands of war brides and children who were being escorted back to Canada at the end of the war. An anonymous OD's recollection of saying farewell to this small group is worth quoting at length. One train load included several of our own girls, all of whom were pregnant and two of whom were already widows. They were being sent home to have their babies in safety. They were also cutting ties. This wartime life in which they had loved and married, in which their friends had shared their happiness and their tragedy, was to be exchanged for the unreality of home where everyone would be kind and no one would understand. Their hands clung to ours and we stayed with them until the last possible moment. In many cases, these bonds of friendship and shared adversity outlasted the war by decades. At the beginning of my talk, I mentioned the Overseas Club, this sort of veterans or alumna association for members of the Overseas Detachment. For 60 years, the Overseas Club kept the ODs connected through local branches, 
memoir, museum, and fundraising projects, newsletters, and annual reunions. They held their final gala reunion in Ottawa in 2005, when most surviving members were in their 80s and 90s. As Nancy Lang, one of the co-founders of the group, put it, they had, quote, shared so much, tears, fun, and a lot of hard work, so the bond was, in a way, inevitable. Returning to the Odie's wartime social lives, it's not always clear which outings were romantic and which were just good fun with a platonic friend, but both versions provided important boosts to resilience and active dating didn't necessarily spell romance. It's worth noting that the lines between friendship, romance, and sexual passion are fuzzy and they can easily overlap and shift. And the key point I think is that all three are typically marked by some degree of closeness, warmth, and love, as well as a tendency to help each other from a genuine concern for the other's well-being. So they serve the same purpose in boosting resilience, whether or not we can tell exactly what was going on. Core women were spending some of their prime marriageable years overseas, surrounded by men who were either eligible or willing to philander, uh, so romance and its various outcomes were constantly in the air. Lois McDonald wrote to her parents in March 1944 about a typical weekend for her. Two servicemen had asked her out on Friday night. She had received three separate invitations for Saturday and four for Sunday. I seem to keep our household amused with my social life, she wrote. With so many young men around and so few single girls, it's not surprising to be busy, but rather fun. Military and civilian dances in particular were staples of all the OD's lives, and they brought emotional labor into their off-duty hours. Their desire to avoid disappointing servicemen drove them to accept invitations to dances even when they were dog tired after long taxing days. And it required great effort to continue to be charming and funny and sympathetic as the occasion required with dance partners night after night. But at their best, dances boosted everyone's morale. And I think the most telling assessment of this labor, but also payoff that was involved in dancing with servicemen comes from Lois McDonald. From Belgium, she wrote that the ODs and nursing sisters all, quote, realize that the young fellows we dance with have been on patrol and in battle all day, so really look forward to a little relaxation and fun. Then she added, also, it keeps our spirits up or we could drown in sorrow. With all of this romance in the air, it's not surprising that a wave of weddings took place immediately before the D-Day invasion, which was hinted at by the buildup of troops and the cancellation of leave, and then another wave followed the VE Day celebrations. Many couples decided to marry back home, but 86 core members couldn't wait and got married overseas. Once again, their support networks pitched in, helping with planning, finding suitable apparel, acting as witnesses or members of the bridal party, or simply as guests. Such weddings were attempts to snatch a bit of happiness and to forge long-term relationships in the face of uncertainty and danger. But of course, everyone knew that the happiness of the brides could prove short-lived. And Lois MacDonald observed shortly after D-Day that there were new widows among the ODs every day. Core memoirs, letters, and oral histories don't mention lesbian relationships, but there's anecdotal evidence for them in the Women's Armed Forces and among military nurses so I think it's important to keep in mind that there could also have been lesbian relationships among the ODs. Whether it was with the same sex or a different sex, extramarital sexual activity definitely spiked during the war years, and a lighthearted December 1944 newsletter written by residents of Core House contains a sidelong glance at the presumed sexual activities of certain ODs. It, rank, it, excuse me, it mentions a high-ranking officer who, quote, did not turn up until the night after the night before, as well as another who, quote, went out one evening and was seen coming in at 8 a.m. the following day, shoes in hand, hair on end. In general, however, core members kept pretty mum about sex. We do know, however, that at least six unmarried members became pregnant during the war. One disturbing element of core women's off-duty interactions with servicemen was the very real threat of sexual harassment, various forms of sexual assault, and rape. The servicemen that, servicemen that they worked and socialized with were steeped in a hyper-masculine, aggressively heterosexual military culture of wartime. So it's not surprising that Mary McDonald was warned it was not safe for respectable women to visit Piccadilly Circus at night. <laughs> 
or for Jean Ellis to fear being raped when she got lost alone after dark in the Normandy countryside, nor for Lois MacDonald to criticize the British officer class for its apparent belief that Canadian girls in uniform were easy prey. Nursing sisters and women in the armed forces had similar experiences. But as we've seen overall, Corps women received significant boosts to their own morale from the social time they spent with servicemen as well as with other women overseas. And in time, these various ties spun themselves into webs of social interaction and support overseas, no matter how tenuous the individual threads would have seemed back in Canada. The best of these ties kept the core members going, replenishing their resilience through laughter, support, and connection. So in conclusion, what do I wanna say about this? Well, the letters, memoirs, and oral histories left by the women of the Canadian Red Cross Corps Overseas Detachment offer a moving glimpse into the nature of their personal and professional lives. Through them, we see that caring and connectedness were vital to the morale of servicemen and of the civilian women who worked and socialized with them. Members of the Overseas Detachment stood as tangible signifiers of home front support and care to the servicemen that they supported. Their emotional labor was understood as distinctively feminine, and whether on duty or off, they themselves saw such work as a particular obligation of their gender in wartime. In the face of destruction, separation, and loss, ODs created, maintained, and lived out intricate networks of kinship, friendship, and romance, and filled their leisure hours with activities that fostered social connection. These ties shaped their experiences and replenished their resilience, helping them to bear the demands of their work and the stresses of wartime. So I'll close with one final little anecdote from one of our core ladies. Looking back 50 years later, OD Nancy Turwitt Drake observed that her letters home from the Warriors were all extremely happy. This was partly because of her passion for driving her Austin ambulance, and partly, she said, because of the emotional meaningfulness of transporting wounded servicemen between airfield and hospital, direct from the fighting in Northwestern Europe. But, she added, the camaraderie she shared with her colleagues was important too. It was a hard life, she concluded, but a life together with other people. Thank you. Thanks so much, Sarah. Um, it was just so good. Those quotes that you pulled from the three, uh, the three women, um, were just tremendous. They were so brilliant, so packed with such humor and such life. Um, and I, I, we have lots of, well, questions are starting to filter in, but before we do turn it over to the Q&A portion um, and those that just came for the talk start to leave, um, I would like to remind everyone that we do have two of Dr. Glassford's books available for purchase tonight. I've included the information in the uh, chat function just at the bottom of your screen. If you click on that, chat function icon, um, you'll notice that um, her Mobilizing Mercy, A History of the Canadian Red Cross, published with McGill Queen's University Press, is available for 20% off. You'll have to enter a discount code at checkout, but um, again, just take a look at that chat function at the bottom of your screen for how to do so. And the second book that we have available, um, a co-edited collection called Making the Best of It, Women and Girls of Canada and Newfoundland During the Second World War, upon which much of this talk is actually based. So if you would like to hear some more um, of the tales of those three women, women and others. Um, again, just go to that bo bottom of your screen, click on the chat function and um, you'll, you'll receive a discount code for 50% off um, with the University of British Columbia Press. Anyways, I've already said too much. I will turn it now back over to Jeff and I may even jump in for a question because I just, I love the presentation so much mm -hmm. um, for a, a question myself. But Jeff, I'll, uh, I'll turn it over to you for the Q&A. That was terrific, Sarah. It was really, uh, it, it fills in so much about, uh, as, as you said at the beginning, there were so many stereotypes that have been kind of nurtured by books and films, especially about mm -hmm. the role of women, you know, were they uh, war brides or were they Piccadilly commandos or mothers that they were writing home to? It, 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 there's so many different ways that your material is, is uh, giving a kind of form to these people that that's really, really important. I, I we've got a, a few questions that I'll try to uh, work through and I'll say in advance that uh, 
logic logistics prevent me from uh, allowing or allowing everyone to have all their questions answered. Uh, we've got full oh, half an hour or so, and we've got uh, a few hundred people online. So if everyone asks a question, we just can't answer them all. So please forgive me as I take a, a bit of uh, chair's privilege and I'll try to filter things through and acknowledge as many as I can. But every so often, as Eric said, we like to leap in here too and ask our own questions. That's, that's what we get to do. Um, here's a, it's a good question by Frank Simpson who just asked his dad was wounded in Wunsdrecht in October of uh, 1944 and uh, might've been with a black watch. Where do we know when some of the hospitals were set up? Cause you mentioned there is, he's wondering where his dad might've been treated by the Red Cross. <laughs> now we're, that's, that's a hard question, but you mentioned number 12, um, number 12 Canadian Field Hospital is set up in Belgium, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and they're, when they arrive in Belgium, they're just behind the lines sort of thing. And then they stay there, I think, until into 1946, possibly even 1947. So the front gets further and further, but they really stay put because they had a good facility. So there would be a lot of, you know, those 17,500 people that yeah. passed through in that, you know, single year alone uh, could well have been have been there and uh, yeah the number seven hospital was the other one that I mentioned and it was more in in Normandy um, moving up. Right. Lines. I think there were three if if I understand this correctly I'm just looking at this myself there are three Canadian field hospitals in Normandy mm. along That's with I think right. seven in Britain or seven British ones that are set mm. up in Bayeux yeah. and then as you say they start kind of following the front line so do we know where the one now I'm these are all my great questions. Do you know where where the one in Be in Belgium was? Was it? I, I'm thinking it was. I could look it up. <laughs> so okay, don't worry. Don't worry. I could look it up. Uh, we do know where it was. I just don't know off the top of my head. Yeah. 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 I don't know either. And and see, I'm not. I'm not trying to win any points here. Um, <laughs> David Patterson, who I know kind of well. Hello, David. Fascinating presentation. Thanks very much. Did any of the women speak? to why they chose the Red Cross over any of the uniform services, because we know each of the three Army, Navy, and Air Force had auxiliaries yeah. that included women. And also, did any of the ODs speak about their relationship with the nurses they worked with? Because mm -hmm. they obviously were in, many of them were in hospital situations, but they weren't nurses. Yeah. Uh, so to the first question, I have wondered about that a lot, and I wish they said more <laughs> because it's a question I would very much like to answer. But little tidbits here and there, uh, and my own just having read a lot from them, um, kind of intuition is that uh, there's a couple of things at play. First is that this Red Cross Corps is up and running as a unit that's training people to provide hands on service in case of emergency earlier yeah. than the three armed services. It's very much of a time with the paramilitaries that later get folded into the armed services. So, so women, I think in some ways, we're just sort of seeing this was a way to get involved earlier. Yeah. Um, there definitely is a migration from Red Cross Corps into the three armed services auxiliaries once they're established. Not huge numbers, but definitely some women who think, ah, that's what I really wanted to do, so I'm gonna move in. Uh, and the fact that they had some experience with drilling and hierarchy and that sort of thing, basic training with the Red Cross actually helped some of them not quite jump the queue, but but get in uh, fairly early. Um, and there's also uh, a fairly strong current of people kind of running the odds in terms of which of these is going to get me overseas soonest. So oh, yeah. there is, as I mentioned, movement between the two uh, and some people who served overseas for both. One of the women I quoted uh, was in the Air Force as well as in the Corps and was in Europe with both. And it just sort of depending what she was looking for at one time or the other, she had picked one and then moved to the other. Um, and, uh, and there were a few that I've come across who started, I don't know if they were in the armed forces, they at least started that process and then realized they weren't going to get overseas anytime soon because they were being used in Canada to fill spots. Uh, and so they switched to the Red Cross, which then is able to start sending women over uh, at the end of 42. Okay. Um, but I think there's there's maybe a special place for this group of women 
between what I said about sort of traditional wartime women's voluntary work, which is very domestic focused in a lot of ways. It's a lot of fundraising. It's very much traditional women's work. And then the armed services, which, you know, are having whispering campaigns about, you know, why would women want to be in the army? They must all be promiscuous and this sort of thing. And so there's this space in between for the Red Cross Corps where they have some of the trappings of being in the armed forces and they have the chance to go overseas potentially, but they're still safely under the umbrella of this widely known, well-respected, safe for women voluntary organization. So that's kind of where I fall in terms of why I think somebody might have chosen uh, the Red Cross Corps. Uh, and remind me, what was the other part of the question? Something about <laughs> nurses? It was, how did they get on with the nurses in, in some of the right. field hospitals, I suppose, where they were? Yeah. Um, they don't say too much about it, but what they do say is positive. And there were definitely, you know, in many cases, if, if we're talking about Red Cross women who were with the field hospitals, there are so few women in those war zones that they're all staying together, whether they're Red Cross or nurses. So they're having those same kind of communal living experiences, being supportive. The ODs are being called in to fill in when the nurses can't do certain things, as I talked about with Jean. Mary McDonald spent most of her time not actually doing her Red Cross work, but working in administration for the hospital because it freed up somebody else to do something. Um, so there is a, a fairly close collaboration. And I think there would have been a shared sense of, of being women in a war zone. You know, there's something kind of that helps them bond in, in that respect. Um, and there definitely was no confusion over whether the Red Cross girls were nurses or not. They were not trained nurses. They didn't, they were not in the military. There was a clear distinction. And the Red Cross women would not have attempted to infringe on nursing duties. You know, happy to help out if that was needed, but but not trying to, you know, step into that zone. They they were there essentially to free up the nurses from having to do the letter writing and the brow bathing and, you know, some of those caring things, which nurses also did, but wasn't really their job. You know, they have much more training that they could be using in more efficient ways. So, so I think there was a sense that these are really compatible sets of tasks um, and, and that they worked fairly well together. Yeah, yeah. It, it, let me lead in from a question from Michael Boire at RMC, who says, brilliant, thank you. Um, he asks about women's percep women's oh women's perceptions of British society, mm. and, and I, I was thinking about that in the sense too that, that I'll call them your women yeah. are are officers like they're given officer rank aren't they? Mm -hmm. so yeah. it, and it's fascinating how in in your talk and in the article um, they seem to have more interaction with male officers as well mm -hmm. isn't it? and there's the, the so there is a kind of social class element here too that's reflected in the hierarchy yeah uh, but i so if you want to comment on that but in some ways i guess it's michael who's talking about women's perceptions of british society mm -hmm. you know, he spent a lot of time with british troops in in britain yeah yeah um i I would say it, it sort of follows the pattern of, um, I'm going to forget the exact title, but Jonathan Vance's book, I think it's Maple Leaf Empire, where he talks about Canadian yeah. servicemen mostly in yeah. Britain, um, and, and that there's a range of responses. Like there definitely is, a, there are a lot of Anglophiles <laughs> among the, these Canadian Red Cross Corps women. So they're super excited to be in London. Like this is the cosmopolitan metropolis, and it's full of these amazing things. And it's in the, you know, by the time they arrive, it's in the midst of like, keep calm and carry on, you know, like wartime Britain that we think of. And so they just dive into that and muck in and are very much impressed by the chin up spirit of the British people and, and you know, filled with admiration for the suffering they're going through and what they're doing and, um, you know, enchanted by country houses that they visit and pastoral landscapes and the white cliffs of Dover and, you know, all of this is yeah. just amazing to them. And when you think, you know, some of the small places they're coming from, this really is their big globe trotting life adventure that they think they will ever have, you know? Yeah. Um, so lots of positive stuff, but there is also Lois McDonald is fairly critical of the British officer class and how they think uh, Canadian women are a maybe easy print pray um yeah. there's definitely some criticism of the food and not just because of wartime shortages but like 
we're trained in cooking. Don't these people know how to cook a proper meal? Like what, why are they boiling everything to death or, you know, these kinds of things. Um, and, and a sense of being there, you know, especially if they were involved in some of the canteens and things that they were providing a service to Canadian servicemen by offering them food that was better <laughs> and, you know, better prepared than, and, and more like home than what Britain could possibly offer. And uh, so there is a little bit of that colonial superiority and, and fighting against an imperial superiority and, you know, all of those tensions that we know exist play out as well. But I think generally speaking, it's fairly, it's a fairly easy fit for them because they are largely Anglo-Saxon white women going over. Sure, sure. Um, Elizabeth McKee asks, could you tell whether any of the women experienced, uh, we talk about resilience, but do we know how, if some women didn't, and mm. we're using the phrase PTSD now, uh, we know yeah. that, that there were nursing sisters in the First World War mm. who had a, a convalescent facility in mm. England. Was there any way in which the material that you looked at talked about women, given the conditions and, and their relative lack of training, they aren't nurses and they're being thrown mm. into these horrific yeah. field conditions. Um, many of them I'm sure uh, didn't show resilience. Yeah. Yeah, I, I wish there was more information about that. Um, there, there won't even be really information in future as things come into the public domain or, you know, restrictions are lifted because they weren't official government anything. So there are no service records for them except what the Red Cross kept, which boils down to one page, you know, where were they from? <laughs> Did they get married with their new name? And where are the places where they served? I think it also includes like, did they have a dental exam when they <laughs> when they were demobilized? Um, but there's just that's it. That's the official oh. record entirely. So which is now at the War Museum and will be open in about 10 years time. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, for whoever's out there getting excited about research projects. Yeah. Um, so there's not the kind of record that we see, say, for veterans from the First World War or eventually that we'll see from the Second World War, um, which I think will always make it difficult to answer this question. Um, but I will say that there, there certainly were personality conflicts that are mentioned um, that could, if read in a certain way, reflect people not coping well. <laughs> you know, it could be they were just kind of a jerk or didn't, you know, get along well sharing a room because they weren't used to that or, you know, whatever. Um, but it could also be people who just were struggling um, and, and that there wasn't uh, an official support system for that. And, you know, my example of, of Dorothy Burgoyne uh, Doolittle not being able to watch war scenes and, and bombings in TV. I think that speaks volumes. And that was just a conversation I had with her daughters. And they were like, oh, yeah, you know, she seemed to like it. She always had these great anecdotes. Oh, but she, you know, would leave, physically leave the room if we were watching something and, and you know, bombings came on. And I think probably there was a fair bit of that. Um, you know, I wish we could know more, but we probably never will. Yeah, yeah. And, and this, again, is tied to it because, uh, yeah, I'm just thinking they aren't, they aren't members of the armed forces, so their personnel mm -hmm. files are pretty brief. So there's no sense of getting decorations or commendations. No, one or two of them were mentioned in dispatches uh, okay. that served overseas, and a couple of them received, I can't think of the specifics, but were decorated by the French government in some capacity because some of them stayed on after the official end of the war and did work with um, civilian relief and refugees and this sort of thing. And so, and a couple of them were there like right till the end of 1947. And they're the ones that were uh, were acknowledged by the French government specifically. I think one of them, well, Mary McDonald was given a, a souvenir, um, I don't know if I have the right term, but like an adjutant stick, like a, a leather bound brass knob stick that she could carry under her arm, like a, I don't know, a corporal or something. And uh, it was engraved and it was sort of a thank you to her from the local community uh, in, I think, Belgium for, you know, services that she had provided. So there is an acknowledgement um, and uh, a number of years, well, decades, actually, after the end of the war, um, the women thanks, I think, in part to their own advocacy for themselves and a little bit of pressure from the Red Cross, were acknowledged as having done a form of war service for the country and came under the Veterans Charter in a small way. So they were eligible eventually for a certain amount of pension support if they could, you know, prove certain things. So 
Um, so, and I think that's why these service files were created by the Red Cross was because they needed some kind of record to prove yeah. that these women were who they said they were. Um, so, you know, I would love to see kind of how that played out, but uh, it was fairly late. A lot of the women never qualified for anything and, and I'm not sure what records there are. You're answering the question, it, it, Mark, Mark Cube, I think it is, forgive me, Mark, for mispronouncing your name. He, he's saying that given did they receive the recognition they deserved upon returning to Canada? Or was it the usual Canadian approach to say thank you softly and quietly? <laughs> so it sounds like the latter. I, I think the latter, um, but also a lot of them, you know, they were getting married. They were part of the baby boom year. You know, a lot of them were really eager to get on with life uh, and, and, and dropped out of the Red Cross Corps fairly soon after demobilizing, not, you know, in an angry fit, but just sort of like, I did my thing and now it's on to peacetime life. Um, yeah. but I think the fact that a pretty high proportion, like I would say in the realm of 50 to 60% of these 600 and some women who went overseas were active members of this overseas club alumni association yeah. for upwards of 60 years. <laughs> you know, suggests that, that it meant something to them and that they were, they were celebrating themselves, <laughs> whether yeah. anyone else was going to do it. And, and one of the things that they did was they thought, you know, it's great to have these social get togethers once a year, but because I find the overseas club actually an interesting research story in itself. So they had these annual reunion dinners where they would get out the photo albums and the scrapbooks and, and one lady could fit into her nursing auxiliary uniform until she was 80 years old and she put it on every single time and like everybody else was just jealous as anything um but he's sort of a living doll you know um yeah, yeah. But, uh, but they would have these social events and local branches would meet you know once or twice every every few, uh, month or so but they also decided they needed a purpose to help them stay together as a group so they took on fundraising work for the red cross uh, and just totally on their own steam would raise money through a variety of things and then decide which program they were going to give it to or which branch. And they, they funded a lot of the Red Cross's um, health equipment loans. Like you could borrow wheelchairs and crutches and raise toilet oh, yeah. seats and stuff yeah. for years and years. A lot of that was paid for by these women. Um, so, you know, so they felt some kind of connection to the Red Cross, even though they weren't active volunteers and they were very much arm's length. Like the Red Cross kept trying to draw them in, like make them official volunteers. And they're like, no, no, we're our own thing. You know, we're going to be autonomous. But they also were like, but are you aware of the important service we provided during the Second World War? Because if you aren't, you should be. And here, we're sending you our book and we're sending you our pamphlet and, you know, this kind of stuff. So um, I love that they were very, very self-advocating and self-celebrating and that they created their own archive. And then, you know, not only did they give their, their archive to the Red Cross around 2005, but they also at the same time donated complete uniforms uh, to a number of museums, including the War Museum, like sort of crowdsourced, you know, who has a purse, who has the socks, who had, you know, whatever they had kept uh, and were able to give those. So they were determined that they would be remembered, whether they were thanked quietly or not. Yeah, yeah. Which was, which is that resilience mm -hmm. continuing, you know, I mean, I can think of so many uh, women, you know, who were my parents age who were of that kind of mindset you know they just mm -hmm. quietly volunteered and it was a volunteer thing it's amazing that they weren't paid five dollars a week just to keep yeah. them in uh some kind of token pay but but they didn't see the need and they didn't see the, rec the need for recognition and it's a it's a mm -hmm. remarkable kind of situation that they're in that yeah. it's really neat that you've over that that you've uncovered this so nicely mm -hmm. um I'm just, oh, here's a good question. Well, they're all good questions, but again, I'm, I'm being careful. I think uh, Eric is, is vetting questions for me. Uh, this is a student, Sarah Hart at Carleton University, and she's looking at wartime photography, another great topic. I'm wondering if your informants took or circulated photographs and if these photographs reflected their experiences in the diaries uh, uh, and other personal remembrances or if they, if the photographs communicated something different. Yeah. Well, this is why I'm so disappointed that my screen share was getting error codes tonight because <laughs> oh, yeah. there are so many photographs from these ladies. I mean, not, you know, millions, but 
a lot more than I expected. And again, it's because they pooled their resources. So it's, you know, three from so-and-so and six from so-and-so and 25 from so-and-so's trip to Edinburgh. Um, and they put them together in uh, photo albums and scrapbooks. And then, you know, even in other people's collections at different archives, there usually are a couple of photographs. And the ones that I had chosen for my slideshow tonight really did reflect the kinds of things that I was talking about. So there are some of, of women and servicemen singing together at Christmas, and there's a Santa Claus in the middle, but it's just this sea of servicemen and little female heads, you know, dotted through. And that was was a social event hosted by the core women. So it's their fun Christmas outing, but they've invited all these guys. So it means they're still working, you know, even yeah. uh, cheery and, you know, everybody have a good time. Uh, there's ones of, of some small groups in their off duty hours, uh, servicemen and women having a beach party or a beach picnic uh, in Scotland, which I'm sure was very cold, but it looks nice. <laughs> um, you know, there's, there's pages from scrapbooks of tourist photos of, of France and little groups of women posed together like you do with your friends when you're traveling and um, a certain number of photos of, of the women, uh, some staged and some, some obviously staged and some uh, okay. less staged uh, of the women actually doing their work. So you can see women in the office in their uniforms. Uh, the, the most stagey ones tend to be core women at the bedside of patients because they're not actually you know if it's for a red cross publication they want to indicate these are sick and wounded men but they don't want to actually show you any sickness or wounds and they want to make it clear what it is the women are doing so everybody's just like got these thousand watt smiles you know and the patients are the happiest looking patients you ever saw with the cleanest head wounds and you know whatever um so there is there's a stagey quality to it but i also love that because it, it really speaks to the performative nature of what these women are doing, right? Their job is to go in and be fake happy if they're not real happy, to help make patients fake happy if they're not real happy. Um, so, you know, it's kind of a fitting visual representation of what's going on, although, you know, kind of amped up to a ridiculous degree. Yeah, yeah. I We've got a, a, a few more questions. Brian Rainville just sent me a note, and, I, and I'm embarrassed. He thinks this is a swagger stick. He thinks that the the uh, uh, item that was presented to your to your OD was probably a swagger stick. This is my uncle. That is what it is. Yes, thank you. Right here. So I'm, I'm yep. sure it's uh, so. Thank you, Colonel Rainville, for that uh, uh, that quick point of of order. Uh, two quick questions, and then we'll wrap up. And I I do appreciate. It's fun to have this exchange. I feel like you know we we uh, are are kind of working together, but with other people. Were there any signs, and it's a great point by Laura Scott uh, Krauschich, and I'm sorry, I think I pronounced your name wrong, Laura. A significant number of boys who jo joined up underage. Any women that we know who would have joined up underage uh, to mm -hmm. volunteer for the Red Cross, or were they sufficiently screened to make sure that they were uh, of, a, of a particular age? Because yeah. even then you're still talking about very young women, aren't we? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's been hard to pin down the official range because um, not a lot of the official uh, enlistment or sign-up sheets have survived. Um, yeah. I think the range was roughly 18 to 35, which, you know, seems seems reasonable. Um, to my knowledge, underage going overseas was not a thing for these women, in large part because they had to put in so many hours in Canada as volunteers and go through all this training before they were even eligible to be considered. Like there were a lot of people who wanted to go overseas who never got to go. Um, and this was kind of, they were skimming the creme de la creme off the top. Um, so if you were underage, you know, skipping school to put in your volunteer hours, I feel like that would have been unearthed before you actually finished and were eligible, you know, and, and these are, yeah. are detachments in people's home communities and largely, you know, there were a lot of sisters who joined and cousins and friends and co-workers and things. So people knew who was there. And I think that would kind of screen out, you know, you're not walking up to a, a an enlistment tent and saying, you know, ready, I ready. And then they ship you off, you know, as soon yeah. as possible. So yeah. I feel like it, it wasn't really as much of an issue. And it must've been a function again of resilience is perhaps a function of maturity. Mm -hmm. so, you know, I wonder if yeah. it would have been unusual, I suppose, for younger uh, women, but yeah. you know, should have been for younger men too. Mike Boire just mentioned number 12, uh, Canadian General Hospital was in Bruges, not in Ghent. Oh, so thank yeah. you, Michael, for that. Last question. Um, 
and this is uh, a question about uh, church mm. affiliation. Um, how secular was the Canadian Red Cross in the 40s? Were the ODs recruited from and by churches? Mm. And were they expected to participate in religious activities or is that up to the individual? Mm. Um, the fact that I have not come across very much tied specifically to the core and church yeah. suggest that it was a pretty low key element. I know that there was at least one church parade uh, when they were in London, because there were lots of photographs taken of it by the press. They were very scenic as they marched down the street. Uh, yeah. So that was, there was an, a church parade at least once. Um, but I have also found in at least one letter that while a bunch of women went to the, the I guess, Anglican, you know, whatever church of England, um, that some of them went to the local Methodist chapel, some of the Catholics went elsewhere. So there certainly was no prescribed religion, although perhaps there was an expectation that you would go somewhere yeah. um, you know, when they were overseas and, and doing this. Um, a lot of them were working on Sundays uh, anyway, you know, just the nature of their work. So I don't think there was that sense of, of having to perform religion regularly if it didn't really fit in with what you were doing, although many of them were religious and made a point of going to some of the European cathedrals or, you know, kind of making their own religious pilgrimages in a way, yeah. uh, either after the war or when they were on leave and that sort of thing. Um, so there is an element of that. Within the larger Canadian Red Cross during the Second World War, um, it's it, the Red Cross is deliberately non-denominational not anti-religious, but it's it's meant to encompass everyone. So they really downplay religion. However, they were not above using religious leaders to motivate donations and memberships. So they appealed specifically to Jewish leaders, Baptist leaders. The United Churches had a Red Cross Sunday where they would mention from the pulpit that this was a good thing to support. Right. They got the Catholic uh, I think Archbishop of Quebec and the Anglican Archbishop or Bishop of Quebec specifically to appeal to those two linguistic and religious groups. So they're trying to mobilize through that, but also to stay kind of above it. Um, so, so I don't think that there was recruiting for the core through churches. It seems to have been more word of mouth uh, within because so many people were involved with the Red Cross anyway. And there also is one scrapbook that shows some, I think it's from Toronto and Hamilton newspaper ads that they took out. So they're just casting the net widely um, yeah. as the armed forces would later do. Remarkable, from Victoria to Charlottetown, as you say, Red Cross chapters just across the country. Mm -hmm. Sarah, this has been a terrific presentation. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm, I have lots more questions, but I'll, <laughs> I'll, uh, we'll chat, and and I do hope that people get a chance to uh, pick up your work, and uh, and I think you've really given us a neat sense of the battlefield, and and a and a really crucial sense of how people have. Uh, we have to talk about the battlefield as a specifically male space, but but the intervention of women on the battlefield, particularly of, of your women, really gives us a fascinating view of, of so many elements of the war that we just haven't talked about. So thank you. Thanks very much. Well, thank you. And thank you to everyone for your great questions. Yes, wonderful questions. Eric, I think it's up to you to lead us home. All right. Well, thanks again, Sarah. I just reinforce what Jeff said. I've been getting texts from people um, emails is saying how much they enjoyed the presentation. It was it was truly just tremendous. I really enjoyed it, and I think a lot of other people did as well. Um, before I kind of conclude things here, I'll remind everyone that our next event is going to take place in two weeks on the 30th of June. Um, again, at 7.30 p.m. Eastern Time, our usual start time. Um, we'll be having Dr. Lee Windsor from the University of New Brunswick and the Gregg Center, um, who will be leading us on our moving back to the kind of tactical battles of Normandy, um, but he, for his talk, is going to be speaking on the second half of the battles of Normandy. Um, the talk that he's going to be speaking to in two weeks is called The View from Point 67. Um, some may be confused that they only have to register for uh, one of the talks in order to be able to attend all of them. That's actually not true. You're going to have to register for each and every talk. So if you haven't registered for Lee Windsor's, I would highly recommend you go to our website, canadianmilitaryhistory.ca forward slash webinar to register. In the meantime, I want everyone to enjoy the beautiful weather that we're having across Canada. And we all um, hope that we'll see you again very soon in two weeks. Have a great night. <laughs>